He's here. He's here? Yeah. I have mine, but... Here he comes. Good morning again. Good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome. I call to order the meeting of the Audit and Compliance Committee of the University of Houston System Board of Regents. We have a busy agenda today. So let's get underway. Our first order of business is approval of the minutes of the Audit and Compliance Committee meeting held on August 14, 2014. Are there any corrections to these minutes? Do I have a motion to approve the minutes as distributed? Motion. There's a motion. Is second. there a second? And there a second. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. That motion is, is approved. There are 12 items being presented before you today, all of them for information only. Our Chief Audit Executive, Mr. Don Guyton, will be presenting these items before the committee. If anyone has any, a question during the presentation of these items, please let me know. Mr. Guyton, will you please present the items listed on Audit and Compliance Committee agenda? Thank you, Regent Welder. Uh, item C refers to the external audit reports for fiscal year uh, 13. The independent CPA's report on the application of agreed upon procedures at the, of the athletic department. That's on page 8 in your iPad. Uh, the audit report and financial statements of the charter school. That's on page 29 of your iPad. And the financial statements and independent audit reports of the University of Houston system, public broadcasting, public media. That's on page 87 on your iPad. And the University of Houston System Endowment Fund Audit Report, and that's on page 123. Uh, the financial statements of the charter school were approved by a special call meeting of the Executive and Compensation Committee of the Board on eight, uh, December 18th in order to meet a Texas Education Agency filing deadline. The other supplemental information has been excluded from the endowment fund financial statements, and that is in, uh, on file in the Board of Regents office. These schedules are the uh, schedule of non-current uh, investments and the schedule of changes in net assets by endowment. Uh, <clears throat> this year, we had two CPA firms engaged to prepare reports for these engagements, uh, Belt, Harris, Paycheck, and also BKD. Uh, you've been provided with bios of the uh, engagement partners who are here today to uh, provide brief presentations on their report. Uh, the first uh, uh, CPA I'd like to introduce is Mr. Robert Belt and also Joshua uh, Belt Harris and Paycheck. Uh, Mr. Belt, would you make your presentation on those two financial papers? <clears throat> Absolutely. They wanted to get the meeting kicked off with a big bang this morning, so they asked an accountant to go first. <laughs> so bear with me. Uh, first item I'm going to present is the NCAA agreed upon procedure. This sometimes get used as slang audit, uh, NCA audit. But in the accounting world, uh, we can only use the account, accounting terminology audit when we're auditing financial statements. Uh, in the case of NCA procedures, we are asked by the NCA or they prescribe specific procedures they would like us for, to perform, and we perform those procedures, and then it's yes, no, uh, and then the management also provides a response to those particular items. I want to recognize Mr. Collier, uh, head of the department, uh, that did a great um, job of getting all the information we needed to perform the engagement, and it went very smoothly. We didn't have any findings of significance. Uh, Joshua Harris is our auditor that actually took part in the engagement. I wanted him to bring up and give him a chance to at least stand at the podium with me up here. i uh, be more than happy to entertain any questions you uh, may have on the NCA. Otherwise, I'll go on to the charter school. Any questions? Okay. okay. As noted, we had previously presented the charter school engagement. Uh, back in December to meet the TEA's deadline for filing the report. Uh, again, this was a clean opinion. There were no modifications to it, with the exception of and one of the items I was asked to talk about again is the adverse opinion. 
And this year, the AICPA changed the format of the standard opinion letter. And when you're doing an audit of a segment, which the University of Houston is a segment of the University of Texas, I mean, of the state of Texas, and then you have a department within the university, it goes on and it has a basis for an adverse opinion paragraph in here, in which it describes it in full, and then it has adverse opinion, which those are very negative terminologies, and I certainly agree with everyone that that is, but that is the correct terminology to use in this particular case. Uh, but other than that, the charter school was in great shape, great shape fiscally. Uh, everything was fine in that regard. Again, more than happy to entertain any questions you have on the charter school audit. I don't see any, so thank you very much for your report. Thank you. <clears throat> we do have uh, Ms. Carolyn Black from the charter school here and also Jeff Collier from the athletics. Uh, if you have any questions on that. Uh, the next CPA firm I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Brian Kruger, Mr. Greg Sissel, and Kevin Lozano of BKD, who will make a presentation on the endowment and public media financial segment. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Greg Sissel with BKD, the audit partner. This is Brian Kruger, a director with BKD. And then Kevin Lozada is in the back there, um, Kevin being the one that did most of the work, actually. Um, we're going to start out with, uh, um, of course, the entities that we, uh, that we audited, uh, the uh, endowment fund and Houston Public Media. We're going to kind of do these together um, because the required communications for doing the, uh, to, the, to the board or to, the, to those charged with the governance is uh, very similar, so we're just going to kind of walk through this as, uh, as combined uh, entities. The, uh, basically, um, starting out with, uh, with our responsibilities in the audit, um, our responsibility is to conduct the audit in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles of the United States of America. Um, we are required to obtain reasonable assurance, not absolute assurance, which basically means that we're testing transactions, we're not testing everything. And I'm only going through these because these are required audit communications. Um, additionally, um, communication of significant uh, matters related to the financial statements to those charged with governance is also our responsibility. Um, the next section, the significant accounting estimates, there really were no significant accounting estimates in Houston Public Media. Um, of course, there are accounting estimates, but there were none that were significant. The significant accounting estimate related to the endowment, of course, is the valuation of, uh, of the investments, um, basically the absolute return funds, the private investments, um, as well as the real estate um, investments have some, uh, have some measure of accounting estimate to them um, and we're required to uh, relay that information to you. Um, under financial statement disclosures, um, disclosures were appropriate um, in accordance with uh, generally accepted auditing standards. Uh, no, no, it, no, uh, no issues there. Um, as disclosed in the financials, Houston Public Media financial statements include presentation of a component unit uh, um, Association for Community Broadcasting, and that is a, uh, a significant disclosure within the Houston Public Media financial statements. Um, I'm going to let Brian talk a little bit about uh, audit adjustments um, that were posted within the financials. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, with regards to audit adjustments for our audit of the endowment fund, we did not have any audit adjustments noted as part of our process. We did have a few that we posted as part of the process of the uh, Houston Public Media audit. These adjustments centered primarily around, the significant ones centered around uh, balances owed between public media and the university system. There's two components to this. They have a deficit cash balance they've carried for a few years. There's also a note payable that relates to the purchase of the KUHA radio station. Uh, as part of our process, we ended up truing up those numbers uh, posting an adjustment to do that, to uh, adjust to the university's balance as confirmed to us. 
Uh, we also had a few minor adjustments we posted primarily at the request of uh, the Director of Finance related to pledges, um, accounts receivable related to underwriting, and uh, some accounts payable items we came up. These were all pretty insignificant, uh, certainly under our materiality level, but we're asked to post these by the Director of Finance. Uh, going on to audit adjustments that were not posted, these are the past audit adjustments. Again, for the endowment fund, we did not have any past adjustments either. On the uh, public media side, we did have one. Uh, it was a pretty insignificant entry, about 28000 It's related to uh, revenue recorded in fiscal 13. should have been in 12. Uh, certainly did not warrant a prior period adjustment because of the minor nature of this. So we just uh, passed on making any adjustment to that. I'm going to turn it back to Greg here for a moment to uh, talk about a few other, other required communications. Yes, uh, within our responsibilities to you, we have some additional required communications um, that include um, just basically a laundry list of things that there were um, no significant changes to the accounting policies in 2013. There were no disagreements with management, no issues with uh, problems with, uh, with management. Uh, we're not aware that management has consulted with other CPAs um, during the year um, in order to obtain a, uh, a, a different opinion on the financial statements. Uh, significant issues discussed with management concerned the adjustment um, that Brian just talked about, and we'll have a little bit more information about that in our internal control section. And then the other significant communications uh, between management of EKD are the management representation letters that are signed at the conclusion of the audit. Uh, the internal control matters that I, that I mentioned, um, we're going to have Brian just kind of walk through the, uh, the control levels and then uh, what we found. Thank you. So as you all know, the, the three levels of uh, deficiencies that can be reported in audit, this is the management letter portion of our uh, communication. These control deficiencies, which are the most minor uh, significant deficiencies which raise up a little bit. Material weaknesses obviously are the worst type of deficiency you can have. Uh, in the endowment fund, we did not have any deficiencies noted. Regarding uh, public media, we did have a significant deficiency related to just the adjustment and the reconciliation process for uh, these interfund uh, balances between the system and uh, public media. Uh, like I said, the adjustment was certainly less than material but I think did warrant some communication to uh, you as the governing board. Sir, uh, was that a reporting issue? Was it just a matter of it, It's more of a reconciliation issue, I believe. I'm sorry, sec I'm sorry. So was that a reporting issue? Was it, was it the way that we record the information? Was it how we characterized it? What was the issue that made it significant? Uh, I think what makes it significant is just more that um, that there wasn't a process in place to reconcile these balances between what the university system is showing and what the public media is showing. So uh, just ha having a process to make sure that there doesn't end up becoming a material difference. Okay, do we have a process in place as a result or uh, was that something uh, we're going to correct? I uh, implemented a process to do that, yes. So did, did, is BDK recommending a process to us so that we correct that in the future? The recommendation is, is just to implement a process, and I do believe uh, Christina has, uh, has uh, implemented this process. It's basically the implementation of a process and then documenting the review of that process. Right. You know, you, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but it just needs to be done. It, the review of it needs to be documented, and then yeah, the issue is resolved. Okay. We, we have uh, Christina Campos here, the Director of Finance. Uh, if you want to hear from her. No, we don't need more detail. I'll just okay. make sure that as a result, we have a process in place to correct it in the future. Do, we'll make sure correct. that happens. Okay. And with that, we certainly would like to extend our thanks as well to uh, Raymond Bartlett at the uh, Endowment Fund, Christine Ordonez Campus, the Finance Director of Public Media. Both were uh, very helpful to us in this, this our first year of uh, getting us grounded and getting us all the information we needed on a timely basis. So thank you both very much. Thank you. And that's all we have unless you have questions, comments. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you all thank very you. much. <clears throat>
Item D in your agenda on page 162 of the iPads refers to an external audit report. This is the Texas Comptroller of Public Accounts Postpayment Audit of the University of Houston, Victoria. Uh, the scope of this audit included a sample of payroll, purchase, and travel transactions during the period September 1, 2012 through August 31, 2013. The audit identified four exceptions. Uh, that's on page 166. There was a salary underpayment and overpayment, and there were two exceptions with prior service dates, which affected longevity pay. Uh, these exceptions were corrected by the institution, and uh, these audits are performed about every two or three years by the state comptroller's office on all our institutions, and we're currently undergoing another one at the University of Houston uh, right now. <clears throat> Do you have any questions on that report? If not, we'll move on to the next agenda item, E. This is on page 177. This refers to the Institutional Compliance Status Report for the six months ended December 31, 2013. This report lists activities which include risk assessments, compliance audits, compliance committee meetings, risk mitigation, and hotline reports. The report also contains a uh, table on page 2, which is 179 in your iPad, which uh, summarizes the results of the system-wide mandatory training for all components. We had a high completion ratio uh, percentage among all the employees taking this mandatory training, and this is a, really one of the uh, strongest things you can do is to make sure your employees undergo this training. And it does come in handy. Uh, the remainder of the institutional compliance report summarizes the information provided for each institution for their compliance functions. Uh, do you have any questions on any of that information that's listed? Yes, I do. On the hot, I'm sure. On the hotline reports, how do we manage those? Are those managed internally or do we have an outside? We're actually going to have a little presentation at the end, the last agenda item. Uh, we summarize <coughs> all of the anonymous reports that came through in FY13. And tell you a little bit about the results, and we also uh, have a little PowerPoint presentation on how we manage that activity. Oh, so that's that's, that's, that's on that's the agenda for today. Meeting. Yes, okay, that's the good. very last yeah. agenda item. If you Thank can you. wait till then, we'll. Uh, I look forward to that. <laughs> I can wait. I can wait. <coughs> All right. You you read my mind, Doc. Uh. Actually, uh, uh, Donna Cornell and I spent a lot of time making sure that these reports are appropriately handled. Uh, next agenda item, item F, refers to the internal audit briefing booklet, which was, <clears throat> which was distributed under separate cover. The first tab of the booklet contains an activity outline. It's on page 194. <clears throat> As you can see from the outline, we prepared 11 internal audit reports since the August Audit and Compliance Committee meeting. The executive summaries of these reports are behind tab two. It's on page 197. And the individual reports are on page uh, behind tab five, which is uh, page 213. These reports address areas included in the board approved audit plan and include departmental compliance reviews of the University of Houston Research Division of the University Colleges of UH Colleges of Technology business honors. <clears throat> uh, we also have a review of UH Research Administration, a review of grant made by uh, to UH by the Joint Admissions Medical Program, reviews of the annual reviews of the Board of Regents and Chance for President's Travel, our annual non-compliance report, which summarizes all activities of non-compliance during the previous fiscal year, our reports on uh, construction awards during, the six, uh, during this period, and also our report on our follow-up activity. Uh, these reports will be submitted to the Governor's Office of Budget and Planning, Legislative Budget Board, Sunset Advisory Committee, and the State Auditor's Office, as required by the Texas Government Code. Uh, these uh, reports contain the reports containing management action plans are in the blueprint booklet behind tab 4 on page 204. An overview of all of our recommendations is behind tab 3 or page 202. 
Audit report number uh, 1401, uh, on page 214 is our follow-up report. Hold on, Mr. Guy. Yes, sir. Can we go, go back to page 195? Is that the annual, um, sort of our annual audit plan, and what is that? Does that show the We're status get as you work, page 195? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so we expect all those audits to be completed by the end of the year. Is that the annual? Plan? No, we'll actually have some carry forward. We'll try to initiate them during the year, and we'll have some carry forwards going forward into FY15. So, is this part of the annual audit plan that the board approves? Yes. And so, each meeting we get a status on where you are in each of these. Yes, sir. At your recommendation, we actually started including this table in the briefing booklet. Uh, and it says basically we have uh, footnotes on the bottom. It says what phase they're in. So if you look back on the outline, the previous <coughs> page, you'll actually see the ones that we have currently in progress that are not being reported on. That's under number two. Okay. And in parentheses, we, we put the date where we estimate that report will be on the agenda. How big is your staff, Mr. Gatt? Remind we me. have 11. 11 auditors? Yes, sir. We'll cover the whole system. I'm just asking on number four. It, it, we can't, I can't read it under the notes. Under the footnotes, what is number four? Reporting in progress is number three, but I can't see number uh, Oh, on the table? Yes, sir. Please. What is the Page 195. Number four, C something. Completely. Keep going. One more. It's the legend. There's something that's blocking the right, legend right. on our I think it's the computer. Completed. 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 <laughs> there it is, right there. You guys are complete. Those are complete. I think I yeah I can yeah. see it through here. That's what okay. I said. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Yes, sir. Any other question? Okay. <clears throat> Audit report number one, our follow-up report addresses the status of uh, 62 action items and 25 uh, individual audit reports. We verified that 47 of the action items have been implemented, 13 partially implemented, and two not implemented. Updated management responses were obtained on the partially implemented and not implemented action items. We have uh, six high-risk items in this report, of which four have been implemented. I'm sorry, could you point to the page? Yeah. They're on pages 219, 219. to 226. My uh, eyes aren't quite that good. <laughs> Did you have a specific question about those? No. I, I, okay. I'm in trouble reading. Okay. I'm in trouble okay. reading, but that's okay. Go so he can you continue? Did you yes, yes. No, no, no. Go ahead and continue. All right, Mr. Payne. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I've got my bring with me. Uh, audit report number two, 1402, is uh, it's on page 227, is the construction award status report. <coughs> this is a standing report in our briefing book that's similar to the follow-up status report. <coughs> At the uh, Quest of management and members of the board and the internal audit department began performing these additional procedures for the awards of construction contracts requiring Board of Regents approval. Uh, we did started that in FY 2011. The objective of our construction award review is to determine whether a major construction activity <coughs> uh, 
if that, those awards comply with the institutional policies and also with uh, statutes, particularly the Texas Education Code. Uh, this report covers the activity from July 1, 2013 through December 31, 2013. <clears throat> Appendix 1 in this report, 229, page 229, indicates the scope of the internal audit review. That spells out the specific procedures that we employ. Uh, there was really not much activity during this six-month period. Uh, previously, we've had greater activity, but it, it's slowing down a little bit now. <clears throat> do you have any questions on any, any of that activity? I do. Okay. Did you, did you do the same type of analysis with all um, contracts, university contracts, or just this construction? Just construction. <clears throat> And was that done, is that a standard practice, or was that something that was brought up by in recent history and asked? Pardon? Was that something that was brought up recently for y'all? Asked kind of like what Chairman Hollingsworth said, you know, he had brought some of these things to your attention, and y'all had uh, Well, what, what we started doing back in fiscal year 11 uh, was giving assurance that we were following policy procedures and statutes with respect to awards of significant construction contracts. Uh, now what we have done, uh, and we also have another agenda item in here, it's called an annual procurement report, mm -hmm. which lists all activity that needs to, all procurement activity that's required to be reported, not necessarily approved, to the, to the Board of Regents. You know, so we've got that as an agenda item in the report today. <clears throat> so for, with respect to the construction, the summary is, the construction contracts, the summary is every contract is <coughs> handled appropriately according to institutional policies and statute. It's the, it's the contracts that require, that require your approval. Okay. That's what we address. And that's your conclusion? I mean, I know it's in here, but I'm just... Yeah, we kind of we if we if we find something that's unusual, we'll point that out in the report. And we have had unusual items before, and they have been conveyed. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Do we have and we have an external firm that does our post construction audits? Correct. I know this is when you're looking at the procurement. We have a procedures. pool of construction auditors who actually right. do this. Part of the do we have a report on that, or, or we don't are we not at a point we don't? We don't have a report on that. Okay, because uh, we haven't completed any projects. Right. We, we do don't have, have any. periodically had construction. Uh, and basically, what they're doing is make sure that the contractors are billing us uh, in accordance with the terms and, right. and conditions of the contract. And uh, we we first started this process. Uh, it was it was very good because it identified some gray areas in our contracts, and we tightened those up. So is that is that only done once construction is completed, or do or, or is it an they ongoing mid, process? They do a midpoint and then a final. Before we release the final payment, they'll finish the audit, and that's just on the. I think it's everything over a million, if I'm not mistaken. Who's the Who's the firm that has that for us? They have a pool of firms. Uh, the, the facilities planning and construction uh, department is responsible for. Uh, selecting a pool, and they do have, I think, three auditors that they have engaged. They try to just split the work up among those. Well, in the procurement, we selected three yeah. firms to assist us with that. They, these are uh, they're specialized auditors. Uh, they're not like uh, CPAs. Right. They're, you know, they're more like a, a oil and gas joint venture auditor. <laughs> you know what I mean, Spencer. Has that work just rotated? Pardon? How the projects are signed, are they just rotated so the yeah, next they, firm they, in line gets they the just next rotate project? Them. They just rotate them. Uh, and then they'll, they'll go out for a new pool approximately every three years, you know, new RFP. And when's the last time we procured that, those services? Uh, when's the last time we procured those? Yeah, I mean, when's the last time we made a selection and when was, when was the next time we'll go I out? I think it, was, it must have been a couple of years ago. Okay. If you could just let me know that. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you know. Thank you. I have a question. Okay. Go ahead, Paul. So uh, did I understand you? The auditors just look and audit billing procedures on how either we're getting paid or billed? 
Or do they go through each of the contracts? So if oh, they go through each of the, the e items in the each of the procurement items. Uh, you know, they'll they'll make sure that they'll check the payroll. They check. They make sure that you're not paying rental on equipment that you could have bought with the, mm -hmm. for the same amount. There's there's all kind of uh, games can be played in the construction industry. So that's they know uh, the tricks of the trade. They know what particular contractors have a tendency to do. So. Uh, you know, the, the, the experienced construction auditors have audited uh, contractors basically all over the place. It's a fairly thorough process. I think one year we had a, had a report, I believe, where um, the insurance that they had procured was uh, sub substantially more expensive than it sh than market rate. And we were yeah, able to, most of those, I believe, we end up getting dollars back from. Right. For the, the, the insurance manager. is a big, uh, that's a big, yeah. big area. Where you're area <laughs> that has a lot of variance with respect mm -hmm. to yeah. opinions and valuations. Yeah. So. Are all the contracts in lump sum or cost plus or uh, half of them are cost plus, half of them are lump sum? Well, we have, uh, we haven't really done many turnkey jobs lately. These are contract manager at risk. That's a method of procurement. Mm -hmm. The and education, you have, the, you have design bill, you have uh, contract manager at risk. You just, we, we really not, they try, they have a budget. And uh, when you start putting change orders in the budget, you know, after you made your budget, that's when things start changing. Well, on the C CMAR, when they bid, we have a, we start with a guaranteed right. total price. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So on those CMA projects, CMAR projects, we get a. Lump we, lump I mean, they lump. they bid based on a number for the cost of the entire project. Now, of course, there's, there's change orders, and then those I assume those are negotiable depending on what the change order relates to. So, if I understand it correctly, all of them are lump sum unless we make some changes. That, as a general rule, I'll say you're right. Sure. Uh, just to for, the, for the benefit of the new board members, I forgot, would you tell them how long you've been in this position at the University of Houston? Yeah, I actually met uh, individually with all the new board members and we went through that. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. The student reads it, doesn't know. Mm -hmm. Pardon? I said the student reads it, doesn't know. Okay, yeah, I've been here 26 years. 26. We didn't audit it. <laughs> yeah, we need to audit that. That's right. Okay, Mr. Guyton, you can proceed because I know we still have quite a bit to get through and we only okay. have about 20-something uh, minutes left for our meeting. Uh, <coughs> okay. <clears throat> okay, uh, audit report number 14-03 <coughs> is a compilation of areas of non-compliant for FY 2013. Uh, for all of our departmental reviews. This report will help management take action to address repetitive instances of noncompliance. These actions that may include modifying current online training programs and providing additional training. Audit report number 14-04 on page 238 is our review of University of Houston Victoria's contract and grant administration. The objective of this review was to determine whether the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs has established management practice for externally funded programs <clears throat> as recommended by the Council of Go on Government Relations. In our opinion, the institution has established these policies and procedures consistent with these guidelines. Audit reports number uh, 5, 7, 10, and 11 are departmental reviews of the UH Division of Research and the UH College of Technology, UH College of Business, and UH Honors College. Uh, I'd like to introduce, uh, we have two of the deans here today, uh, Dean Fitzgibbons, oh three, excuse me, Dean Fitzgibbons, uh, Dean Monroe, and Dean Wampshire. Thank you for being here. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, audit report number 10 is a required audit 
for a grant that provides funding for programs that support economically disadvantaged students interested in attending medical school. Page 249. It's on page 249. Thank you. Uh, we found no instances of noncompliance with those grant provisions. <clears throat> Audit reports number 8 and 9 on page 259 and 261 are annual views of travel and entertainment expenditures of the Chancellor President and members of the Board of Regents. In our opinion, all the expenditures are appropriately documented and allowable under university policy. Do you have any questions on our follow-up activity or any of these other audit reports? Good report. Yes. Yeah. Going back to tab one on page 193 of the booklet, uh, on the activity outline, you'll see we have items two, three, and four of that outline. Uh, we have various scheduled audits in progress in the reporting, field work, or in progress phase, the planning phase. These audits are included in the board approved audit plan for 13 and 14. Uh, you see on item four, down on the bottom of that uh, outline, we have various special projects in progress. One of these items listed under item four is the state auditor's annual statewide audit. The state auditor's office has completed its field work for the UH Federal Financial Assistance Program. Uh, we don't have any findings at this time, but um, there will be some. <clears throat> uh, they drafted their findings and recommendations, and uh, they should be finalized this month. Uh, during the past couple of months, uh, the Internal Audit Department assisted the State Auditor's Office performing certain procedures in conjunction with the review of the financial statements of UH Victoria for its upcoming accreditation review. Uh, this review is conducted by the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. Every 10 years, uh, when they have the site visit from SACS, uh, we have to perform some work for the state auditors who have to review their financial statements. So we just completed that. That was issued, and it will be on the agenda for the May uh, Audit and Compliance Committee meeting. <clears throat> uh, we've already talked about the audit status, audit plan status. That's on the page behind there. <clears throat> Say today that area is complete, and the footnotes indicate the other areas. Uh, any questions on any of the internal audit reports or the briefing booklet? No, I will move on to the next item, item G. This refers to the ethics and conflict of interest policies of the yes. board and each page, of the universities. Page 280. 280, excuse me. Item number 23 in the Audit Committee Charter and Checklist requires an annual review of these policies to ensure that these policies are in place at all levels. <clears throat> Not only are these policies very important for all institutions, they're also required in order to have effective compliance programs in some federal agencies such as National Science Foundation, NIH, Department of Agriculture, and Department of Energy require conflict of interest policies as a part of the terms and conditions of their awards. As a result, if you, have, uh, you want to get awards from those entities, you have to have them. Uh, we've included a summary <coughs> uh, of the policy changes from last year to this year. That's on page 281. It's just a one-page uh, or two-page summary that tells you what those changes were. Most of the changes were very minor. However, this year there was a change in the uh, Board of Regents conflict of interest policy that conformed to changes in a recently passed law regarding accept acceptance of gifts for salaries. And we addressed that in the August uh, committee meeting, board, board meeting. There were also some minor changes in our uh, research conflict of interest policies in order to clarify some of the disclosure requirements. Uh, all other changes were for new approvals, dates, update, updated references. Any questions on those policies? <clears throat> Item H on page 358 
refers to the Annual Fraud Prevention Awareness Report. The Audit Committee Planner, <clears throat> Item 505, <clears throat> requires the committee to evaluate <clears throat> the management's identification of fraud and risk, fraud risk and implementation of anti-fraud prevention and detection measures and the creation of the appropriate tone at the top by reviewing an annual report which summarizes the fraud risk analyses and related mis uh, risk mitigation strategies. This report also satisfies one of the requirements of Governor Perry's Executive Order RP36 relating to preventing, detecting, and eliminating fraud, waste, and abuse. This report is a compilation of each university's comments on the status of their fraud prevention and awareness program. The agenda sheet on this item lists the key points of the report <coughs> and the related page numbers in the report. Do you have any questions on that report? Item number I, page 365, uh, refers to the executive summary of the UH system's identity theft prevention program. The audit committee planner, item 506, requires a system-wide compliance officer to annually prepare an executive summary of all activities of the identity theft prevention program of the component institutions. <coughs> Uh, approximately five years ago, the Board of Regents implemented a policy on identity theft prevention in order to comply with the uh, Fair and Accurate Credit Act and, and the implementing rules promulgated by the Federal Trade Commission. This executive summary is prepared in response to the Board of Regents policy and describes the progress that each institution has made in establishing and implementing uh, their programs. The agenda sheet, page 365, lists the key points of the report and the related net, uh, page numbers in the report. Uh, this has been a very important program. Uh, all of our computer systems, major, major computer systems now, uh, send emails out when someone changes their uh, bank account information or address, and, and they're supposed to notify someone if they didn't, and, and we have had some instances where, you know, it's come in handy. <laughs> Item J on page 370 is the annual procurement report of the University of Houston system. Board policy 5501.4 on page three, uh, 371 requires that an annual report uh, must be submitted to the board listing all professional services and consulting contracts to a single entity greater than $250,000. And for all other procurement except investment agreements where total compensation from system-wide sources to a single entity is expected to exceed a million dollars. The Internal Audit Department reviewed the methodology for compiling the report, including the procedures and criteria used to create the report. In our opinion, the report preparation methodology appears to be reasonable and, and the report satisfies the reporting requirement for procurement activity. Uh, we have our controller here, Mike Glisson, who prepared this report. And if we do have questions uh, specific to any individual procurement activity, we'll be glad to take those. Who sets those reporting thresholds, John? Who sets the reporting thresholds? The board policy. The board did. Okay. It's now, that's, is that statewide? Is that no, that's your set? policy. Is that, are we similar to what other universities do? do we? I don't know. I, I don't. I, when we looked at when we created this, I think we looked at all of those. I'm not aware of others that are doing this same kind of report. Other okay, so we're over and above. Yes. Yeah, our peers. Well, and this gives the board a snapshot of, you know, procurement, who we're paying, what vendors we're paying over over a quarter million dollars, and then which ones we're paying over a million. I don't know if you guys had a chance to look at it, but it's a pretty pretty extensive list. Um, I think it's great. I just wanted to ensure that yeah. that uh, we had the proper protocol. Well, and it's just, uh, I mean, it's good oversight. Of course, our chancellor has up to a million dollars in authority, so it's, so these are things that we don't normally see at the board table for during the year. So once a year, it's it's a good um, for us to see that. Many years ago, it used to be fifty thousand dollars for consulting, any consulting activity. That's for back you. when fifty thousand was fifty thousand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so just, I have a quick question. Yes, and I, 
I think you answered it somewhat in your in your comments, and so that's the reason when it says approved by regions, it says NA or doesn't have a date on it, it's because it, the threshold lies below what comes to the right. board. Just, it's just a report for us to know. Yeah, we've indicated in there N slash A, which means right. it's not applicable because right. it did not. But some of the numbers are significant in, in total, and so that's why I wanted to know why they didn't come in. Mm -hmm. uh, the chairman answered a little bit. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next item, agenda item K, contains the Board of Regents internal audit, institutional compliance, and identity theft policies. The audit committee planner, item 303, requires an annual review of the Board of Regents policies on internal audit and institutional compliance. There have been no changes to these policies since the Audit and Compliance Committee reviewed them in, in uh, January 30th. 2013 meeting. I'd like to point out a couple of things about the Board of Regents Internal Auditing Policy 4101 on page 381. This policy serves as the internal audit charter and it establishes the framework for the internal audit function. <clears throat> Paragraph 4102, uh, 4101-2C of this policy requires the internal audit department to adhere to the standards for the professional practice of internal auditing and the IIA code of ethics. Internal auditing standard 1010 requires the chief audit executive to discuss the definition of internal auditing, the IIA code of ethics, and the standards with the board and senior management. Paragraph 4101.1C on page 381 of this policy is the definition of internal auditing. It states, internal auditing is an independent, objective, assurance, and consulting activity designed to add value and improve the system's operation. It helps the system accomplish its, its objectives by bringing a systematic, disciplined approach to evaluate and improve the effectiveness of risk management, control, and government pro governance processes. The code of ethics establishes the four principles that internal auditors are apply, expected to apply and uphold. Integrity, objectivity, confidentiality, and competency. The Code of Ethics also contains 12 specific rules of conduct for these principles. Each year, all audit staff, including myself, read the Code of Ethics and sign a statement acknowledging their responsibilities to adhere to the ethic, Code of Ethics. Uh, the IIA standards are comprised of attribute standards and performance standards. The attribute standards are purpose, authority, and responsibility, <coughs> independence and objectivity, impairments to independence and obje objectivity, proficiency and due professional care, and quality assurance and improvement program. The performance standards are managing the internal audit activity, the nature of work, engagement planning, performing the engagement, communicating the acceptance of risk, monitoring progress, and resolution of senior management's acceptance of risk. Every three years, the internal audit department undergoes an external peer review to determine whether the department adheres to these standards. The last peer review report <coughs> was issued in June of 2012, and it was, it was on the agenda for the August 15, 2012 uh, Audit and Compliance Committee meeting. Do you have any questions on the definitions of internal audit, code of ethics, or standards? Do you have any questions on these policies? We think they're good policies. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Item L, page 385, refers to the certification of the annual financial statement. The Audit Committee Planner, Item 3-13, requires that the System Chancellor, the Chief Financial Officer, <coughs> certify the annual financial statements for the UH system as a whole, and that each component president and Chief Financial Officer certify the annual financial statements for their respective component institutions. The agenda contains these certifications. <coughs> Prior to the Chancellor and the Vice Chancellor of, uh, for Administration and Finance signing the certification, the following steps took place. 
Each of the institution's chief accounting officers, chief financial officers, and presidents certify the financial reports for their campuses to be true and correct to the best of their knowledge. The UH and system administrator and unit heads representing 125 departments completed the FY13 Departmental Fraud Risk Survey, which includes questions about verifying cost centers, reporting instances of fraud and noncompliance, and other internal controls. According to the survey results, internal controls are adequate to ensure that the financial transaction is created for fiscal year 13 by the UH and UH system administrator departments are true and correct. Uh, Mike Glisson, the controller, David Ellis, financial reporting, Tom Ehart, Dr. Pelusi, and Dr. Couture signed a certification letter for UH and UHSA consolidated. That's on 388 and 389. <coughs> okay. Uh, also, the certifications for Clear Lake, 391, Downtown, 393, and the Victoria, 395, had rep their representatives sign those statements. <clears throat> Do you have any questions on those certifications? I might just say, board members, these certifications ought to make you sleep better at night. <laughs> uh, if you weren't worried about, them, worried about them before, then you didn't quite realize what you're what your ultimate responsibility was. This is our audit. It's our most important function, I think, uh, at this board. So We implemented uh, these certifications uh, as a result of the Kubo's uh, recommendations of implementation of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. We went through a gap analysis and said what was in Sarbanes-Oxley and what would be a good idea for higher ed to do. So we actually created that gap analysis. Uh, so we really did do a lot of, uh, you know, create. We already had some of the things that Sarbanes Oxley recommended in effect already, but this was one of them that we implemented. Another one that we implemented was uh, uh, about the not trying to mislead the auditors. Uh, you, you know, uh, in public accounting, you can, it's a crime uh, for a public company for someone to try to mislead the independent CPA. So we actually do have that provision in our system policy that intentionally trying to mislead an auditor can result in disciplinary action up to and including termination. And in fact, that has been applied. Well, and that's another step above Sarbanes-Oxley, of course, applied to public companies. So the fact that we've adopted those standards uh, here at the university uh, is a real testament. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Uh, uh, next item on the agenda is item M. That refers to the University of Houston System Internal Auditing Department Annual Report. This report is required by the Texas Government Code. The state auditor prescribes the format of the report, and this is required to be distributed to the governor's office, the state auditor's office, the legislative budget board, Sunset Advisory Commission, members of the Board of Regents, and the chancellor. This is a comprehensive report of the activities of the Internal Audit Department, including executive summary, uh, com which uh, a comparison of budget to actual, a report on our last peer review, peer review report, uh, which is every three years. Uh, do you have any uh, questions or, on, or comments on the annual report? When was our, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. When was our last peer review? Pardon? When was our last peer review again? It was uh, 2012, June of 2012. So we'll have another peer review next year. What we'll do is actually uh, we'll uh, bring a, a slate of proposed peer review team members to the board to see if y'all, you know, and if you do have suggestions, I normally confer with the uh, chancellor and also the audit committee chair if they have any anybody in particular they want to be, you know, institution they'd like to be on our. Uh, peer review team, we'll welcome, we'll welcome those suggestions and try to get them on. Typically, is it just another public universities team? Yes, we we have uh, usually chief audit executives of other institutions participate on a peer review team, and we actually have uh, the Institute of Internal Auditors has a uh, standard manual that's used 
In addition, uh, the state agency internal audit form has a prescribed format to cover some of the governmental uh, auditing standards. So that will happen. Uh, that will happen in 2015. Uh, item M on page 396. First of the, uh, well, we just covered that. Excuse me. Item N on page 458. <coughs> refers to the report on anonymous reporting mechanism summary report. This report <coughs> uh, summarizes the receipt of anonymous reports and their disposition for fiscal year 13. What page is that again? Yeah, that is on uh, page 458. Okay. Wow, 90 reports. Okay. Uh, as you can see from this report, we received 90 reports through the MySafe Campus Reporting System. In addition, we received 22 additional reports through other mechanisms, including the State Auditor's Office. Of the 84 MySafe Campus reports uh, resolved during the year, 20 resulted in disciplinary action. Uh, we're going to have a little PowerPoint here in a minute and tell you how this works. Uh, you, have, you can see in that second paragraph, they're categorized the types of reports. Two of them are fraud. Forty-one of them are management slash human resource type issues. It's six, sexual harassment and discrimination. Ten, uh, behavior. And nine, safety concerns. <clears throat> this system has been uh, been very good as far as, uh, in some cases, pointing out unsafe conditions on campus in addition to things that should be reported that come in handy. <clears throat> uh, we'll now move on to the PowerPoint. Should be right behind there. PowerPoint? Yeah. We don't have it? We don't have this on our system, right? No, okay. I don't think so. No. Okay. We might have to save that for a future meeting. Mm -hmm. We did have the screenshots of the uh, how the system works, and I'm sorry it's not there. I apologize. Uh, I'll just tell you what happens. <laughs> uh, with this mechanism, we have a uh, you know, a person can go online, it's called the MySafe Campus System, and uh, they can actually make a report of various types. We have a profile set up for fraud, non-compliance, sexual harassment, NCAA violations, and uh, there's a default called Other if they don't select a category. When they fill out the template, they, uh, you know, it basically has various things, setting up the condition, what happened. And when they hit the submit button, it, def it sends an email out to all the individuals at each specific campus for that report, which are specified to receive those types of reports. So who? So what are those positions? Uh, you have the compliance officer. You have the institutional person designated for fraud. You have an HR person for noncompliance. You have the EEO for sexual harassment and uh, those types of things. And then you have Donna Cornell and myself who receive each and every one of them. After that button is pushed, the report goes out Donna and I will be in contact to determine who is the appropriate subject matter expert to investigate that specific complaint. Sometimes a lot of them, as you can see from the table, 41 were HR-related problems. So HR gets a bulk of these problems. But in some cases, there are sexual 
some case of sexual assault. I'm going to go through here rather than go to the police. And uh, we, you know, those are handled by the EEO. We have people who it's investigate really, that. The, we do at the police department, if it's, if they allege true sexual assault, it does go to our Good. police department right. also. We also have set up. So that's to differentiate between sexual misconduct and sexual assault. The police chief is on one of the profiles uh, for that activity. So he'll get the very same one. What we do next, decide who's going to do it, then we go out and acknowledge to the reporter that we have received your report and will investigate. In some cases, the reporter provides very sketchy information. In other words, not enough to really investigate. So in addition to the report acknowledgement in the subject line, we'll put report acknowledgement and request for additional information. Now, if the reporter elected to remain, remain anonymous only to the institution, they would include their email to the vendor. And when we ask for that information, they'll get an email letting them know that the institution has posted a message. So we can really have a pretty live dialogue with a reporter if they had opted for that method. If they have elected to remain completely anonymous, then they're provided with a password, a user ID and password from the vendor in order to communicate with the institution. That's if they put the report in writing. Pardon? What if they just called? I mean, they can just call. There's a 1-800 number, too, okay. that they can call to the vendor. And the right. vendor, in that, time, in that case, will post it. They'll, they have intake method. They'll say web or telephone. So they'll let you know what, what it was. So that way we're able to communicate with an anonymous reporter. It's a, it's a good mechanism. And we, we, they can actually upload files, audio files, video files, electronic files, word files. And we've had everything uploaded. Is the vendor for this called My Safe Campus or is that our program? That's the vendor. That's the vendor. The vendor. Most, of, uh, most institutions, higher ed is used, they used to be called Ethics Point. It was bought by the network. And so you'll find a big population using the network. But we, we started out with a small vendor, and they've really been pretty good for about a fourth of the cost. And so we're able to uh, investigate, and once we do complete the investigation, we will post a closing comment on, the, on, the, uh, on that website. And uh, in addition, we track all of these on the spreadsheet that we maintain in our electronic uh, work papers, teammates. Uh, it, we're actually, we can tell you what, that's how we come up with, came up with this report. We can tell you how many reports we had and what happened. So that's how we track it. Now quarterly, I want to meet with the chancellor and also meet with the audit compliance committee chair. We provide this report. We have two reports, a full report, and we also have an open items report. We list which ones are open. So they are apprised of all these situations. In addition, I meet with the, uh, Dr. Carlucci and also uh, Dr. Short, let them know what's happening at the University of Houston. So that's how our mechanism works. That's it. I'm just wondering if uh, this, I can see it's on the bottom of our website. Is this communicated to new faculty hires, staff, and new students? Yes. It's, it's on our the main page of UH website. You can, you can get to it. Yeah, I see that. Is, it, is this uh, verbally or? In new it's hire in, orientation. New, yeah. What about for students? I don't know. I assume it's in the new, new student orientation. Yeah, and, and every year uh, when we go through the fraud training, one of our, our mandatory trainings actually covers this as well. 
we're putting together a training course for the, the users now, which will require the people who actually use the system to make sure they know all the protocols. And that's going to be another online training. And, and I'll add that that's system-wide. So each campus, each of the campuses, has that same hot button on their website, and they do that same kind of training of their employees and, uh, and orientation of new students. I just have a couple questions, and I think it's a, it's a great program, and we went over it when you and I met. Um, so just, is there any kind of closure? So if I'm the reporter, and mm -hmm. you come back to me and say, these are the things that we've done, yeah. everything is great and fine, do I have the opportunity to go, thank you very much, I am satisfied, or thank yeah, you very we, much? We, when we post the closing, up in the subject line, we, I put investigation complete, and then we have a comment. We have a, still have a and actually, the reporter can still have dialogue after we right. close the report. So there's. But but so you you close it on your end. Is there an opportunity for me to say I'm satisfied with this? Yes, I mean they, start, they absolutely can comment after the fact. We don't give a reporter the types of details management would Correct. need to right. to act on something. But they certainly know that we've completed the investigation and have reported it as necessary to management. And then they can rep say back to us, we don't like it, we didn't, you didn't do what we thought you should do, whatever, or thank you, which happens. So, so then on, the, on another note, from a criminal perspective, if it is sexual assault and we turn it over to the police department, at what point does our vendor um, relinquish any information? That it, does it come by subpoena? And, no, it's a different issue, but when it comes to criminal activity, and maybe I put my information yeah. on there and... It's, it's an audit trail uh, okay. in the system, and our contract specifically addresses what they will and will not release. Right. And, uh, but you can actually track every time someone accesses the site, this specific mm -hmm. report, it'll say whether the, when a reporter does, it just says reporter. But it, when it's one of the institutional designated users, it lists that user. Uh, it also, uh, on the dialogue, all the dialogue is, is the trails in there. You can see what, it's all date stamp. And, uh, it really does come in handy if someone doesn't think the institution has tried to properly investigate something, you're on record for what you did. I mean, if I'm asking the reporter for additional information, and they're not supplying that, it's going to show that we asked and they didn't supply. It's, it's, it's and definitely an audit trail. And That's Don great. and I meet weekly. We go through all the open matters, see what the pro progress is in mm -hmm. each of those investigations, and just make sure we stay on top of it. Just I think it's make sure the loop mm -hmm. is closed at the end. I think yeah, it's a we, great program. I do. We have a standing meeting every Thursday. Don and I get together and uh, cover all these open matters. It's very good to know. Thank you. Thank you. I got a question. Uh, what is our average cycle time for completing the report? It's 90 days, 120 days, 160 days. And how many reports are outstanding? Uh, over 180 days or over one year? No, we don't have. We, we've really tightened it up. We just had four until last week, and we added three more. But we try to. Some of them are real quick. I mean, yeah, like uh, every day. cycle time, you see, you know, it's I, can, I can actually tell you that, though, because we have a, the, the, you know, the report gets date stamped, yeah. you know, when it comes in, and then it's also date stamped when we change the status to close, and we, on the spreadsheet we maintain, we have both of those dates, so I could tell you exactly how long, what the average time each report is, and I'll be glad to pull that together. That's easy, that's an easy one to do. Yeah. And, and I'd like to see uh, for each one of these campuses how many reports are outstanding after 30 days, after 60 days, or 120 days, just mm -hmm. like a, a collection that you do. Right. Uh, yeah. so, uh, on uh, how many of these complaints the, are, the, yeah. are outstanding after 60 days and 30 days? Sure. Can we get a summary of that uh, in our board meeting, sure. uh, next board meeting? The, the sure. That way, we feel good that yes, we have resolved everything within 60 days or 120 days. Yeah, I, I, the I, only guess, I guess what I could do is, uh, for last fiscal year, yes. I could summarize the, act, the actual 
you know, stratifying. These reports were outstanding, open for this many days. And then uh, at, at, at the current status on what's open, we'll have to cut it off, though. Yeah. yeah. That would be a good way to uh, look at it. Uh, yes, we are doing great. Uh, no, a lot of reports are outstanding for more than one year. No, we, we, we don't have anything no. that's one year. The only thing I would add is, depending on the nature of the complaint, it might be a good thing for it to be open for a, an extended period of time. It just depends. To get that data, yes, we can gather that data, but without understanding the nature of the complaint, I don't know how much information that would actually give you because you really have to look at all the underlying things that are going on, but certainly we can create that report. That's and, and I would encourage board members that have more questions about the MySafe Campus program to, to visit with the, the administration after, after the meeting because we are, we are way past our time already. But um, um, are there other questions specific to uh, Mr. Guyton's report? Um, do you have anything in addition to uh, report? No, sir. That concludes my report. Um, well, we appreciate the presentation. I uh, want to thank you and your staff for the incredible amount of work that you all do for the university and also for all of those who cooperate with the audit staff. Um, if there are no further questions, uh, we're adjourned. Uh, I, I do want to to state for, for Chairman Armour, we, we need a five-minute break, and, uh, and we'll start the next committee meeting. Thank you all. Thank you.